Greetings, and welcome back to the channel. This was, once again, not the most memorable year in science fiction cinema, but there were a few gems released this year, including the first sci-fi film out of Brazil and a docudrama about the Manhattan Project. But this year belonged to the serials, with all-American guys fighting evil and saving the day. However, the House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC, investigations into alleged communist influence in Hollywood cast a long shadow over cinema in the United States. Although science fiction films weren't directly targeted in 1947, one director I've covered in previous episodes, Edward Dimitrik, was placed on the blacklist as one of the Hollywood Ten. But we'll soon see changes on the horizon as many sci-fi movies of the 1950s will incorporate anti-communist allegories and reflect Cold War anxieties, with alien invasion narratives often serving as metaphors for fears of communist infiltration. But those are topics we'll discuss in future episodes. Brazil stepped into the world of science fiction cinema in 1947 with Uma Aventura Os Quarenta, or An Adventure at Forty, directed by Silveira Sampaio, a playwright making his feature film debut as both director and screenwriter. Originally a medical student, Sampaio switched careers after winning a playwriting award, a decision that would eventually make him a household name on Brazilian television. The cast is led by Flavio Cordero as Professor Miranda, and he's joined by Aida Carmen, Ana Lucia, and Nilza Soltin. The story focuses on Dr. Carlos Miranda, a retired scientist living in the futuristic year of 1975. Attending a TV special celebrating his 70th birthday, Professor Miranda stops the broadcast to reveal the truth of his extramarital affair with a young woman named Jane back in 1947, challenging the official version of his legacy. While set in the future world, the film digs into Miranda's professional journey by confronting his past and being honest with himself. Filmed on location and mostly outdoors, with a very small budget, the production had its share of issues, like having to dub much of the dialogue in post-production because of the limited sound equipment on set which gave it an amateur, unpolished feel. Despite these challenges, the film stood out for its forward-thinking concept of live interactive television, which was possible but not yet used in 1947. During the time of release, it didn't get much attention, since most Brazilian movies at the time were comedies, musicals, or melodramas. But it did have an interesting sci-fi twist set in the future, with live TV broadcast playing a key role. While live TV interviews weren't common until the 1950s, the idea of a character interrupting a live broadcast was ahead of its time. Though I'm slightly disappointed that the filmmakers didn't add more futuristic elements, like tech gadgets and costume design, to show the difference between 1947 and 1975, I completely understand that they couldn't because they were on such a tight budget. This is one chapter in a man's life that feels more like a silent film with narration than a sound film that we're used to seeing in Hollywood. The use of narration was due to the production's amateur level budget. They were unable to get decent sound recording on set, and so the director chose to use post-production dubbing and narration to tell the story. There is a charm to this story and a good reminder that science fiction can take place even in a mundane world. An Adventure at 40 is available to stream on YouTube and the Internet Archive if you would like to check out Brazil's first foray into science fiction cinema. The beginning or the end was MGM Studios' attempt to dramatize the development of the atomic bomb during World War II. It is credited as the first movie to depict J. Robert Oppenheimer and the Manhattan Project blending real events with fictional characters to show the impact of nuclear technology on the world. Directed by Norman Torog, an Oscar-winning director known for his films like Skippy and Boys Town, he would later work with Elvis Presley in Blue Hawaii. 
He brought in a large cast that included notable actors of the era, such as Brian Dunleavy as Major General Leslie Groves and Hume Cronin as J. Robert Oppenheimer. Other prominent cast members play fictional characters. Tom Drake as Mac Cochran and Beverly Tyler as his wife Anne. The story follows the development of the atomic bomb from its conception to its devastating deployment over Hiroshima. It is rooted in historical events depicting the high-stakes decisions made by scientists and military personnel. But it also explores the ethical dilemmas of creating a weapon of mass destruction, as well as the secrecy behind the Manhattan Project. However, despite its ambition to accurately depict the events, the film includes significant historical inaccuracies, such as a fictionalized portrayal of President Truman's decision-making and the Japanese use of anti-aircraft guns on the Enola Gay just before dropping the bomb. The idea for the film began with a high school teacher, Edward R. Tompkins, who then contacted his former student, Donna Reed, who was now a major Hollywood star. Reed's agent and husband, Tony Owen, then discussed the project with the president, and Truman allegedly stated, quote, Gentlemen, make a motion picture. Tell the people of this nation that for them, it is the beginning or the end, unquote. Multiple studios were interested in developing a Manhattan Project film shortly after the war. Journalist Bob Considine, who co-wrote 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, created the film's first treatment for Paramount. Even Ayn Rand was one of the writers attached to early drafts of the script before Considine's treatment was purchased by MGM, where Frank Weed, an aviator and veteran, completed the final screenplay. One of the film's key challenges was securing the permission of the numerous real-life figures, which was required before studios could begin filming. While Oppenheimer signed on to use his likeness, and Groves participated as a paid consultant, other key individuals on the historical record, like Niels Bohr, refused to allow their depictions, resulting in the removal of certain scenes that changed the pacing of the story. Eleanor Roosevelt objected to the casting of screen legend Lionel Barrymore to play her late husband because of Barrymore's alleged negative comments about FDR in 1944. So Barrymore was replaced by Gottfried Turl. The production also faced scrutiny from both the White House and the War Department, leading to changes in the script, including softening Truman's eagerness to drop the bomb. So a fictional scene with the American military dropping warning leaflets 10 days before the attack on Hiroshima was added to make it look like the Japanese were given a warning. Despite the studio's high expectations, dedication to adding as much historical accuracy as possible, and a large $2.6 million budget, the beginning or the end was a box office disappointment, grossing only $1.9 million in theaters. The film also struggled critically. The New York Times remarked, quote, Despite its generally able reenactments, this film is so laced with sentiment of the silliest and most theatrical nature that much of its impressiveness is marred, unquote. Variety did praise the production scripting and documentary value, but found the execution lacking. While it failed to make a significant impact in its time, it is considered the first cinematic depiction of the atomic bomb and the ethical quandaries surrounding its use. The film even became the subject of a 2020 book, The Beginning or the End, How Hollywood and America Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, by Greg Mitchell which examines how Hollywood and the government shaped the narrative of nuclear warfare in post-World War II cinema. Though not typically classified as science fiction, I did want to touch on the film's discussion about scientific innovation, the ethics of technology, and its future impact on humanity. The film's historical setting and docudrama approach differentiate it from the fantastical science fiction films we'll get to know in the 1950s. The large cast feels a bit scattered, with historical figures taking a backseat to ones created for the film. It is also heavy on pro-American propaganda, but it makes for an interesting comparison to Christopher Nolan's 2023 film, Oppenheimer, seeing the first portrayal of the Manhattan Project alongside the latest version is fascinating. 
It is worth noting how much of the Manhattan Project and the Hiroshima bombing Hollywood was willing, or allowed, to show in 1947. The Beginning or the End is available on DVD and streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive. I've also included a link in the description below to a scientific critique of the film from 1947 if you would like to check it out. Before we dive into the serials of 1947, if you're enjoying the content, hit like and subscribe for more episodes on the history of sci-fi cinema. You can also support my work on Patreon, which I'll link in the description below. Your support means a lot and I appreciate everyone stopping by to share their love for this amazing genre. The Black Widow, released by Republic Pictures, is a 13-chapter serial blending crime, espionage, and science fiction, and was directed by serial veterans Spencer Gordon Bennett and Fred C. Brannan. Bennett, often referred to as the king of serial directors, helmed previous titles I've discussed, like The Purple Monster Strikes. Bennett would later go on to co-direct Brick Bradford, which I'll discuss in a few minutes, as well as Adam Mann vs. Superman in 1950. Brannon was no stranger to the genre either, having worked on The Crimson Ghost in 1946, and he'll direct The Flying Disc Man from Mars in 1950. Featuring Bruce Edwards as Steve Colt, a mystery writer and criminologist recruited by a newspaper to investigate the mysterious murders involving spider bite venom. Edwards was known for his work in serials, but he left Hollywood in the 1950s to pursue a career in photography. Virginia Lindley, using the stage name Virginia Lewis, plays reporter Joyce Winters. Carol Foreman, who plays Sombra, the serial's titular villain, is the daughter of the evil King Hitomo. Foreman would go on to play the Spider Lady in 1948's Superman serial. Rounding out the cast was Anthony Ward as Nick Ward, playing a small-time gangster known for his earlier roles in serials like Flash Gordon's Trip to Mars from 1938, and he played Killer Kane in Buck Rogers in 1939. Republic's renowned special effects team, the Lidecker Brothers, were behind the serial's memorable visuals, like the mechanical spiders and tech gadgets. The story follows Steve Colt as he investigates the mysterious murders caused by venomous spider bites. Behind it all is Madame Sombra, who's hatching a plan to steal an atomic rocket engine so her father can take over the world. Sombra, using a combination of trickery and futuristic tech like face-changing masks, disguises herself as a fortune teller, as a secretary, and as the female lead, while plotting global control from behind the scenes. Steve and Joyce face off against Sombra and her crew. The Black Widow is made on a budget of just over $186,000, running about $20,000 over budget making it Republic's most expensive serial of the year. Shot in less than 30 days, the film made use of stock footage from earlier Republic serials like Captain America and Daredevils of the Red Circle to keep cost manageable. In the 1950s, the serial was condensed into six episodes and shown on television. And in 1966, a 100-minute version titled Sombra the Spider-Woman aired on TV. Its futuristic gadgets, like the face-changing mask and atomic rocket engine alongside the global domination plot, make it a fun serial. The dialogue is snappy and the actors work well together. It's not the most groundbreaking serial, but it's worth watching. On a fun side note, the final lines about reporter Joyce Winter's next assignment to find Hitler hiding in the Everglades was an interesting way to show that it was already okay to talk about conspiracies surrounding Hitler's death. The Black Widow is available on DVD and streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive. Brick Bradford is a 15-chapter serial adapted from the popular comic strip by Clarence Gray and William Ritt, and was one of the few sci-fi serials from Columbia Pictures and the first of two we'll discuss in this episode. It combines space travel, time travel, and futuristic technology into an adventurous story. Directed by Spencer Gordon Bennett and Thomas Carr, the serial follows Brick's adventures to the moon, 
time traveling to the past, as well as present day action. The cast was led by Kane Richman as Brick Bradford. Richman was known for his roles as Lamont Cranston in the Shadow series. He's joined by Rick Vallon playing his loyal sidekick Sandy. Linda Layton, credited as Linda Johnson, is June Salisbury. Pierre Watkin, playing Professor Salisbury, would later gain fame as Perry White in the Superman serials. And finally, John Merton as Dr. Tymac. Writers George H. Plimpton, Arthur Hurl, and Lewis Clay took a different approach to creating the story. Each writer was assigned a five-episode block and worked alone instead of as a group on all the episodes. Each block covered a different plot, from one to five taking place on the moon, six to ten in the past, and eleven to fifteen in the present. The story opens with Brick recruited to help Dr. Gregor Tymak develop an interceptor ray, a device capable of neutralizing rockets. However, they become targets of a foreign spy who wants the technology for his own sinister plans. In the first part, Brick and his team travel to the moon to retrieve Lunarium, a rare element essential to using the ray. They face off against Queen Kana, the ruler of the lunar civilization. The second part sees Brick and Sandy using a time machine to travel 200 years into the past to recover a vital formula. The story ends with a showdown in the present as they race to stop the villain's nefarious plans. Brick Bradford used some decent special effects and practical sets to bring its futuristic vision to life, except for the costumes on the moon, which look way too much like simple Earth costumes. And stock footage from earlier films was reused, a common practice to cut cost. The story has everything from time travel, trips to the moon, futuristic technology like an interceptor ray, and even an invisibility gadget. The heroes are way too clean cut, and the villains are rather dull. The first episodes on the moon are the best of the bunch, and the rest of this serial feels like it's in a different universe. Brick Bradford is available on DVD and streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive. Jack Armstrong is a fun 15-chapter serial combining classic adventure with futuristic elements. Based on the popular radio show, Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy, the story follows Jack and his friends as they battle the evil Dr. Grood, who wants world domination with the help of advanced technology. Directed by Wallace Fox, known for his earlier films I've covered in past episodes, like The Corpse Vanishes and Bowery at Midnight, the serial features John Hart as Jack Armstrong. Hart would later go on to replace Clayton Moore for one season on The Lone Ranger. Rosemary LaPlanche, a former Miss America, plays Betty Fairfield, and Joe Brown Jr. is Billy Fairfield. Knox Manning provides the narration. What is this strange place to which Vic Hardy has been taken? What's the secret of these mysterious cosmic rays? He was a familiar radio voice who would later work as a narrator on 1950's Destination Moon, and the Batman series in the 1960s. Rounding out the cast is a very familiar face. Charles Middleton, famous for playing Ming the Merciless in the Flash Gordon serials, is the villainous Dr. Grood. The story centers on Jack Armstrong and his companions, Betty and Billy Fairfield, who are on a mission to stop Dr. Grood, who has kidnapped scientist Vic Hardy, forcing him to help build a deadly ray. From his secret base, Grood plans to take over the world. Jack and his team must rescue Hardy and stop Grood's evil plan. And they get the help of Princess Alora, the leader of a group of people living on the island. Jack Armstrong was aimed at younger audiences, but the one mistake was casting older actors who in no way look like believable teenagers. But the series is well made and looks more expensive than most serials at the time. It's a fun story, and it's great to hear Charles Middleton's voice again. Jack Armstrong himself became a cultural icon, appearing in novels and comics, and a Hanna-Barbera animated series was in development 
but never produced. And footage from that series would later be reused in Johnny Quest in 1964. Jack Armstrong is available on DVD and Blu-ray, as well as streaming on YouTube. I've linked all the films discussed today in the description below if you would like to check them out. By 1947, science fiction was on the verge of earning respect as a serious literary genre, thanks in part to J.O. Bailey's Pilgrims in Space and Time. This academic study explored the history, symbolism, and major themes of science fiction. As a literature professor at the University of North Carolina, Bailey's influence helped raise the genre's profile among scholars and creators. You can find copies on Amazon or check it out for free on the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below. In literature published this year, Olaf Stapledon's novella The Flames of Fantasy is about flame-like beings from the sun trying to share cosmic wisdom with humanity. And as usual at this time, several influential stories were first published in serialized form in Astounding Science Fiction magazine. Henry Kuttner's Fury, written under the name Lawrence O'Donnell, was set on Venus, where political intrigue and rebellion thrive in a society of immortals. While E.E. E. Doc Smith's Children of the Lens continued the epic Lensman space opera series. Jack Williamson's With Folded Hands imagined a future where humanoid robots created to protect humans ended up controlling them. This dystopian story was so influential that it became one of the first astounding stories adapted for NBC's Dimension X radio series in 1950. Robert A. Heinlein's Rocket Ship Galileo, a pioneering sci-fi novel for younger readers, launched his famous juvenile series. It followed a group of teenagers and a nuclear physicist as they travel to the moon and find a Nazi base. The novel loosely inspired the 1950 film Destination Moon. Co-writing the screenplay, Heinlein altered the original story, leaving out the Nazis and the teenagers. And born this year on June 22nd, Octavia Butler would go on to become one of the most influential sci-fi authors of the late 20th century. Her works like Kindred and the Parable series tackle themes of race, gender, and power, challenging the traditional sci-fi norms and opening the doors for more diverse voices. This was a time of major changes that would shape the decades ahead, especially with the onset of the Cold War. The shift in politics, economics, and society provided a backdrop for science fiction films that would soon reflect the growing anxieties of the time, whether about war, technology, or the unknown. History doesn't happen in isolation, and neither does science fiction cinema. Culture, science, art, and film all shape and are shaped by the world around them. To get a sense of the science fiction films of the late 1940s and into the 1950s, it's important to look at the bigger picture. And so for the rest of this episode, I'll dive into some key historical, cultural, and cinematic events from 1947. One event that fueled the public's imagination and left a lasting mark on science fiction was the Roswell Incident, made public on July 8th when the Roswell Army Air Field issued a press release about a recovered flying disc. The military then retracted the story, claiming it was just a weather balloon. But it sparked widespread interest in UFOs and extraterrestrial life. This fascination would explode in the 1950s with a wave of alien-themed films. On February 17th, the U.S. launched the Voice of America radio broadcast into Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, part of the battle between capitalism and communism. A month later, on March 12th, a date some scholars mark as the start of the Cold War, President Harry Truman announced the Truman Doctrine, a policy designed to contain the spread of communism by providing military and economic assistance to countries resisting Soviet influence. Amid this political backdrop, other key global events shaped the cultural landscape. On January 10th, the United Nations adopted a resolution to take control of the free city of Trieste, further illustrating the post-war division of Europe. 
and peace treaties with Italy, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, and Finland were signed in Paris on February 10th, attempting to establish stability in Europe after World War II. Meanwhile, the U.S. Secretary of State, George Marshall, proposed the Marshall Plan in June, a significant initiative aimed at helping European nations recover economically from the devastation of the war. A new constitution went into effect in Japan on May 3rd, turning the country into a pacifist state. On August 15th, India and Pakistan gained independence from British rule through the partition that led to violence and mass displacement. And the U.S. tragedy struck on April 16th with the Texas City disaster, one of the deadliest industrial accidents in the country's history. The explosion of a ship loaded with ammonium nitrate killed nearly 600 people. The National Security Act of the United States, signed on September 18th, established institutions like the Central Intelligence Agency, the Air Force, and the Department of Defense, reflecting a heightened focus on national security. And the United Nations voted on November 29th to partition Palestine, a decision that would lead to the creation of the State of Israel, which would lead to intensified conflicts in the region. This geopolitical shift had far-reaching consequences, still felt today. Society was returning to normal, and culture from music to theater were booming, and television entertainment was just getting started. Classic Comics changed its name to Classic Illustrated this year and gained popularity by adapting literary classics like Great Expectations and Mysterious Island into comic book form. Running from 1941 to 1969, these stories introduced many young readers to classic works of literature. In music, Francis Craig's Near You topped the U.S. charts. It's like heaven to be... Broadway saw the debut of Tennessee Williams, A Streetcar Named Desire, starring Marlon Brando and Jessica Tandy, while the whimsical musical Brigadoon from Lerner and Lowe opened to acclaim. The first Tony Awards were held, honoring performers like Jose Ferrer, Frederick March, Helen Hayes, and Ingrid Bergman. On June 25th, The Diary of a Young Girl by Anne Frank was published two years after her tragic death at the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. This firsthand account of a Jewish family's life in hiding became a global symbol of the human impact of World War II. Television was on the verge of becoming a major cultural force this year. On October 5th, President Harry Truman delivered the first televised White House address. Meet the Press debuted on NBC on November 6th, And this was the first year the World Series was televised, with the Yankees versus the Dodgers. And on December 27th, Children's Television made history with the premiere of Puppet Television Theater, which would later be renamed Howdy Doody. 1947 marked a turning point in sports history as the color barrier was challenged. Jackie Robinson became the first African American to play Major League Baseball when he signed with the Brooklyn Dodgers. And Wataru Misaka, a Japanese-American, was drafted by the New York Knicks, breaking ground in professional basketball. The press stirred up a sensational media frenzy after the brutal murder of Elizabeth Short on January 15th, famously naming her the Black Dahlia. But by the end of the year, everyone in the world was captivated by the wedding of Princess Elizabeth to Philip Mountbatten on November 20th. Breakthroughs in science and technology set the stage this year for many modern inventions. On February 20th, U.S. scientists launched a V-2 rocket carrying fruit flies to an altitude of 68 miles, marking the first time living organisms were sent into space and safely recovered. In June, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist introduced the Doomsday Clock, a symbolic representation of global existential threats to indicate how close humanity was to catastrophic destruction. Aviation history was made on October 14th when Chuck Yeager became the first person to break the sound barrier while flying the Bell X-1 rocket-powered plane. In December, Bell Labs scientist John Bardeen and Walter Bratton 
working under William Shockley, invented the first practical transistor. This small device would eventually replace bulky vacuum tubes. And several technological advancements in entertainment and culture set the stage for future innovations, particularly in video games and photography. On January 25th, Thomas T. Goldsmith Jr. and Estel Ray Mann filed a patent for what many believe to be the first video game, an invention described as a cathode ray tube amusement device that displayed simple visuals manipulated through analog controls. On February 21st, Edwin H. Land demonstrated the instant camera, later known as the Polaroid, and changed photography forever, allowing people to develop photos in just 60 seconds. It became commercially available in December 1948 and was widely celebrated for its convenience and ease of use. Hollywood faced major political challenges when the House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC, began investigating alleged communist ties in the industry. This led to the creation of the infamous Hollywood Blacklist, which targeted the Hollywood Ten, a group of screenwriters and directors who refused to testify before Congress, and included Dalton Trumbo, Edward Dimitrik, and Ring Lardner Jr. I covered two of Dimitrik's films in previous episodes, Captive Wild Woman and The Devil Commands. By November 25th, the blacklist was formalized with the Waldorf Statement, and the Screen Actors Guild even introduced an anti-communist loyalty oath. This climate of fear would affect Hollywood until the mid-1950s. Despite these tensions, we saw a wide range of successful films. The top-grossing films in the United States were Welcome Stranger, The Egg and I, and Life with Father. The 20th Academy Awards were held on March 20th, 1948. Gentlemen's Agreement, directed by Elia Kazan, won Best Picture, Best Director, and Best Supporting Actress for Celeste Holm. The film, starring Gregory Peck, follows a journalist who pretends to be Jewish in order to investigate and expose anti-Semitism in American society. Ronald Coleman won Best Actor for A Double Life, and Loretta Young received the Best Actress Award for The Farmer's Daughter, beating out a heavily favored Rosalind Russell for Morning Becomes Electra. Popular non-sci-fi serials of the year included Son of Zorro, Jesse James Rides Again, and The Vigilante. The international film scene flourished with some remarkable productions. From the UK came Black Narcissus, a breathtaking drama by Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger. It tells the story of nuns dealing with isolation and desire in a remote Himalayan convent. Italy's Shoeshine, directed by Vittorio De Sica, was a moving tale of two boys drawn into the criminal underworld. And in the Soviet Union, Admiral Nakimov celebrated the legacy of a Russian naval hero in a grand war epic. But Hollywood continued to dominate. Miracle on 34th Street, directed by George Seaton, is now a beloved holiday classic that tells the heartwarming story of a department store Santa Claus who claims to be the real Kris Kringle. The Bishop's Wife features Cary Grant as an angel sent to help a bishop and his wife, blending romance and fantasy with a touch of holiday cheer. Crossfire, directed by Edward Dimitrik, before being listed as one of the Hollywood Ten, is a suspenseful drama addressing anti-Semitism through the investigation of a soldier's murder. And finally, Body and Soul, directed by Robert Rosen, stars Sean Garfield as a boxer struggling with personal and professional conflicts. Science fiction is about to emerge from its cocoon. As the 1950s approaches, the genre is ready to break free from the studio's low-budget constraints, evolving into a major force in cinema with bold explorations of science, space, and Cold War anxieties. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more History of Sci-Fi content, and I'll see all of you in 1948.